I'm very pleased to introduce our panel for tonight. We have a number of distinguished guests going to talk to us tonight. And of course, as I mentioned to you, Dr. Paul Tenkati, who is the uh, professor of um, history at NKU and has been there for uh, so long and has done such a marvelous job of directing that department. And then Carl Litzenmeyer, our dear friend, who's been with uh, out here visiting with us on numerous occasions as we've um, uh, had events, and we appreciate his uh, generosity also in sharing with us back issues of the Northern Kentucky Heritage Magazine. And, and then we have Dave Schroeder, who is the executive director of the Kenton County Public Library. And uh, he has been a, a local history librarian himself, the, the position that our Bridget holds. And so he comes with lots and lots of interest in history. And then we have Joe Hines. Where's Joe? Joe. Joe is an author, as are the other. They're all participating in this authorship. And then my dear friend, whom I hadn't seen in so long, Roger Auger. And we kind of go way back, because when I was the city clerk in Florence many years ago, Roger was um, involved in everything besides being a journalist and reporting on the goings and comings of Florence politicians. And so, and now tell me, Carl, who, who is this? Jim Claypool. Jim Claypool. Okay. Co editor of the Encyclopedia of Northern Kentucky. That's right. Professor Emeritus of NKU, where he was the first employee of Northern Kentucky University, right. which is going to be 50 years old in 2018. So that gives you a little hint on this. Wow. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I'm sorry I did not recognize you, Dr. Cliff. Oh, I have your book. <laughs> and That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> All right, so without further ado, who's going first? We're, the four of us are coming All up. four of you. And, and, uh, uh, and Roger and Joe are going to be signing afterwards. Oh, good. And answer every question that you have about <laughs> politics and also about literature. Oh, wonderful. So uh, I want a book, too, so hold on. <laughs> all right, thank you all so much. Let's give them a big hand. Bob and I 
have been unhappy for some years about how <clears throat> the state historians treat this area in their storybooks, including uh, Thomas Clark, I have to say. <clears throat> if you read all of their books, you will find that generally <clears throat> Northern Kentucky is kind of blown off. Um, some of them even say things like, oh, it's just a suburb of Cincinnati. So, uh, and, and I personally have been insulted by that. So uh, I just want to let you know that uh, we have four chapters, I believe, of a book that we are going to publish on Northern Kentucky. And your county will obviously be in that. <clears throat> okay. I don't know how much cake is to write that, but it's going to be it's going to be published. Okay, I'm supposed to moderate this, and uh, I've counted 27 writers, if I'm correct, in, in this wonderful book called Covington, The Gateway City. Um, when I first saw it, I, I wrote one lousy chapter, and uh, it's not a lousy chapter, <laughs> um, and I, I didn't expect it to come out this, this well. I just really didn't. I, I didn't expect it to be this big, um, and, and I'm, I'm intensely proud of it. So uh, it's really terrific. And now with technology today, <clears throat> color pictures can be printed um, with hardly any extra cost. It's just amazing. Um, we used to have to pay $700 a pop for a colored cover on the magazine in the years gone by. Those days are gone, so you're going to see more color. Well, who wants to be first? All right. I don't want to be first. <laughs> Dr. Taylor. I drew the, the short one. You draw the short side. Okay, you're on. Here, you, you have your timer. You got 10. You got ten, we got 10 minutes, and after that, you're supposed to wave That's your right. hands and do you all know, kinds of. It said that preachers preach the first five <coughs> minutes for God second five minutes for themselves, and after that they preach for the devil. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for being here this evening and for asking us to be here. The name of the book is Gateway City. Where did we come up with a name like that? Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, a very long time ago, 250,000 years ago, at the end of the Illinoisan Glacier, Glaciers are like, well, let's, let's use an analogy we all can understand recently, giant snow plows, right? And they take everything in front of them and they just move them on ahead. And 250,000 years ago, the ancient Tees River, which was part of the deep stage Licking River system. So the Licking River used to go up right where it is then it went up through what's called the Mill Creek Valley in Cincinnati. Do you all know where the Mill Creek Valley is? Okay, and then it went up towards Hamilton, Ohio and joined up with the ancient Tees River. Well, glaciers are like bulldozers or snow plows and it moved everything in its path and it dammed up the old deep stage licking and dammed up the old Ohio River and born anew was the Ohio River's route between Lunkin Airport and Lawrenceburg, Indiana, right near these parts, right? And that was the beginning of that part of the Ohio, but more importantly, it was the beginning of the point, which is the confluence of the licking with the Ohio River, which is, of course, the site of Covington. We're not only a gateway geologically, but we're a gateway in terms of climate. Have you ever noticed, well you've more than noticed, you've perhaps um, wondered sometimes if human beings really should be living in Cincinnati because one day we'll have 50 degrees like we did a couple weeks ago and the next day we have zero degrees and you say to yourself, Maybe those Native Americans at the time that the English moved into the area and the French knew something more than we did because they really didn't live in the Ohio Valley right here, right? The historic Indians. Oh, way, way, way back they did, the mound builders and that. They lived a little bit north, right? Up Chillicothe, Piqua, they lived south. 
down in, you know, North Carolina and Tennessee. And then they use this as a hunting ground. And I don't know why I have my own sneaking suspicions that they finally figured out that the weather is unpredictable and anybody that would ever try to plant a crop, right, in this kind of weather would be fooled all of a sudden. Now, why is that? It's because Covington, Cincinnati, Boone County were all part of a climate gateway. They don't teach you this stuff in school like they should, right? Did you know that we are on the transition zone between two major North American climates? If you go just a little further south to Lexington, Kentucky, you're in humid subtropical. That's what they call it, climatologists. And if you go up to Dayton, Ohio, you're in humid continental. And if you're in Cincinnati, it just depends upon the way the prevailing winds are flowing on any particular day and where the jet stream is. Literally, you can track across Hamilton County, Ohio, the difference between frost-free days, which north of a certain line, there are less, less frost free days of that line in Hamilton County and more south of that line and more as you continue on south. So we're a gateway geologically, we're a gateway climate wise, and we're also a third gateway and that is a gateway between the north and the south and we know that that river, Kentucky being a part of old Virginia, we were a slave state. And north, it was free. It was the Northwest Territory. Many people in Covington and Newport on the eve of the Civil War were against slavery. And that was not necessarily because they didn't own slaves, some of them did, but they felt that slavery was an old institution that would hold back the South. So at Gateway, Civil War, brother against brother, Covington, Boone County, Kenton County, Campbell County, all part of that ugliness that became the Civil War. How else were we a gateway? We were a gateway to the West. And that meant that people were leaving uh, Brownsville in Pennsylvania, coming down the Ohio River, and many of them uh, would, uh, you know, land in Maysville, Kentucky, but many of them landed in Covington, Cincinnati, and Newport, and places further west here, like in Boone County. Now, what people don't tell you, and I hope that uh, the new history of Northern Kentucky will, will also tell you, as I and some other people have been looking at the early land grants, <coughs> first of all in Kenton County, and then more specifically, in Covington, but this also holds true for Campbell County and Boone County. This land up here in northern Kentucky along the Ohio River was the most coveted land by Virginia people out here in the west. Much more coveted than anything down south, even in the bluegrass. The most wealthy families of Virginia made certain that they looked after their sons and they looked after their nephews. Unfortunately, ladies, you know, women didn't own property back then, so excuse me. <laughs> and you know the names because they're there. They're the Todd family, as in Mary Todd Blinken of Lexington. They're the Taylors, what well, he owned half of Covington. They're the Colstons of Virginia. They're the Johnsons, Robert Johnson and Cave Johnson. And they're all related by marriage, it seems, because they were all looking out for one another's interests. So uh, have you all done the land grants of Boone County yet, marked them out for the whole county? That would be a fascinating thing to see. And if you do it, get in contact with me, and I'll, and I'll tell you all the stories of how Robert Johnson and Kate Johnson and all those folks all intermarried and knew one another. Then Covington became a gateway between the North and the South. Cincinnati's railroad to the South began in Covington. 
It was finished by 1854, and it was called the Covington and Lexington Railroad, and it became very important. Then the Covington and Lexington Turnpike was built, a later road of the Banklet Turnpike. And Jim, thank you so much for that little booklet on the toll roads of Boone County. I love stuff that deals with toll roads. That is fantastic that you've all done that. So we not only have a gateway between the north and the south and railroads and in turnpikes, but then along comes the Civil War. We all know that this area became subject to a um, attack by uh, Kirby Smith and 8,000 Confederate soldiers. That story has been told again and again and again. But the story that you'll find in this book tonight about Covington is a story that is not really told during the Civil War. Covington was a prosperous, <coughs> happening place. Thousands of Union soldiers left the station of the Covington, Lexington, Kentucky Central Railroad in the 1860s during the Civil War, and that station was at 7th and Washington Street, and they were headed south on trains to uh, all kinds of battlefields throughout the South. What also was leaving on those trains? Bread and baked, all kinds of foodstuffs were leaving out of the bakeries and factories of the city. You know, axles for, for wheeled uh, uh, of the Union Army. Uh, so important was that railroad that the Union Army had to place a regiment on it to protect it against John Hunt Morgan and other people who occasionally, up to that point, liked to come along and rip up the rails and burn down trestles, right, and bridges, etc., and take down the telegraph lines. And so it was so important that it needed to be protected. But also, coming home on the Covington and Lexington Railroad were Confederate prisoners of war. You know, if you were just a private, and you were captured, and you were sent, you know, up north, and they, they generally didn't have room for everybody, just the important people, right? And so if you were a private, the odds were good that you were going to be released. And if you were released, they tell you, just go on back to Cincinnati, go on over to Covington, and you can catch the turnpike or the train back home. So Union soldiers were coming through Covington. Confederate soldiers were coming through Covington. There were refugees coming out of the South, especially black slaves that, you know, just literally left when the Union Army, they were coming through Covington. So you can imagine a city but one very, very sad thing. Of all the places in the nation that I've been able to look at in terms of Civil War hospitals, I don't think there is another place than Covington and Cincinnati that had so many hospitals and so many beds for recuperating Civil War soldiers. It is totally amazing. Most people in the Civil War, in the Army, died not of wounds, but died of all kinds of common diseases that we have all um, cured by now. Dysentery, right? Diarrhea, all kinds of infections. And many of the soldiers who had been wounded and limbs had been amputated the doctors didn't really know about the germ theory of disease. And so, you know, they'd start out that day and they'd use the instruments and then they'd kind of take a rag and clean the instrument off and we all know that that's not going to do anything. So many of them got gangrene. They came to Covington to recuperate and to die. Allison and Rose Funeral Home had the contract with the government to build caskets for the many hundreds, if not thousands, who died in Covington. How many came? We don't know. But we do know this. Steamboats would roll into Covington on a regular basis with 250 wounded soldiers on the steamboat and six soldiers. 
Now, one more thing, and then I'm going to turn it over to Jim, but I have to introduce this because Jim has to tell his joke that he always tells, and I don't give that joke away. You know the wig joke. About what? The wig part. Oh, yes. <laughs> so anyhow, um, I don't much get into politics. Um, and when we looked at Covington, Covington had its political bosses in the late 19th century. It was a democratic political machine. You know where they would buy out the immigrants' votes and so on and so forth and do pretty much whatever they wanted. Now, Cincinnati had one right across the river, so we're going to be an equal opportunity offender tonight. For those of you who are Democrats, you're going to hear your anti-Republican, and for those of you Republicans, you're going to hear your anti-Democrat. So the political machine, the corrupt machine in Covington was Democrat. And that meant that the one in Cincinnati was Republican. But they got along better than the Republicans and Democrats in Congress today. <laughs> Which isn't saying a whole lot. Uh, when Cincinnati had an important election, <clears throat> the Republican Party would call their Democrat colleagues in Covington and they'd send over some men, sorry ladies, men could only vote back then, they'd send men over to vote in the Cincinnati election. These were Covington men, and vice versa. And when they had elections in Covington, they need a few extra voters, they had some come over from Cincinnati. And uh, in 1903, a reform Republican in Covington became mayor. His name was Mayor George Beach. And he pretty well cleaned up the city at that point in time. Now, do you think that the Republican Party in, 19, in November of 1903 in Cincinnati celebrated the election of Mayor Beach, a fellow Republican in Covington? You said no, you win the prize. <laughs> they, they pretended but the paper said that they were actually pretty dejected that the, the boss, Democratic boss machine had uh, not won in, in, in uh, uh, Covington. So that means that we have to clean up our act and turn it over to a man who is neither Republican nor Democrat. <laughs> I've taught both Kentucky history and European history. Actually, I'm, a, I'm an itinerant European historian who lapses into Kentucky from time to time. <laughs> but uh, what Paul was referring to is my students would always ask me what my politics were. And that's not very wise to bring to the classroom. And I finally developed an answer, and the answer was I am a Henry Clay Whig. <laughs> and if you don't know what that means, that means that you believe in some really, really crazy ideas like balancing the budget, <laughs> buying American goods, building bridges, roads, and cleaning up our rivers. All crazy ideas, none of which apply at all today. <laughs> well, I'm happy to be here in Boone County. I have many ties to Boone County. Uh, I helped Nancy uh, Jordan Blackmore uh, write that book on Big Bones Lake, so I know about that children's book. And, uh, you mentioned, uh, Ms. Conrad, uh, about the uh, markers. I'm the Kent County Historical Markers Chairman, and the stand-in for Boone County, unless you've gotten one by now. You do. Well, that's grand, because I signed off on all those signs on the airport uh, oh, yeah. and the uh, flights and such as that, so I'm glad you've got one. I don't have to do double duty, but if you need my help, <laughs> you, you can. My role uh, was to try to pull Paul in. I failed miserably. <laughs> we started out at 256 pages. You see the end result. I could not stop him under any circumstance. I've read this book four times. I, I did most of the major editing of the book. Um, and if there are any grammar errors, uh, blame me. If there are any uh, typos, blame the printer. And if there are any mistakes, blame the author. Don't blame me. <laughs> That's the way it is. I wrote the chapter on sports. And uh, one of the things that's quite interesting, I'll tell you a little story. 
Um, many years ago, back in the dark ages, I used to play football at a little school called Beechwood, and we were playing a school called Boone County, and they had just consolidated uh, from New Haven and Hebron and Florence and so on, and they had been playing eight-man football. They had been playing 11-man football. It was six-man. Six-man, six man, okay, six-man football. And so late in the game, and we actually were losing, which bothered me considerably, but uh, and I was a 157-pound tackle. Uh, in comes this boy who had been eating quite a bit. He must have weighed about 260 pounds, and he was just an old farm boy. Obviously, they never played 11-man football, and I moved him around pretty good for about half half the quarter. And afterwards, he came up to me and he said, uh, "I know who you are." And I said, "You do?" And he said, "Yes." He said, "I want to shake your hand." And I said, "Fine." And I said, "Who are you?" And he said, "My name's Irv Goody." Mm -hmm. Well, some of you may know what I'm talking about there. Irv Goody went on to play professional football with the St. Louis Cardinals, which is uh, uh, for 13 years. Yeah, I'll, I'll translate that for you. If we had played the next year, he would have killed me. <laughs> but we didn't. And Irv, I believe, was born in St. Elizabeth uh, in Covington, although his ties are to Boone County. That's quite common in those days. Well, to me, uh, Covington is a city of memories. I uh, moved from Evansville, Indiana in 1948. My father was a journalist and um, grew up in Fort Mitchell. And I would get down into Covington at my peril, I might add, because in those days, the newsboys on the corner selling the Enquirer, or Time Star, or Post were all Holmes students. And when they saw a Beechwood student, that was not good. <laughs> it was not good at all. But we learned how to survive there. I remember vividly walking across the suspension bridge, and I know you have memories of Covington, all of you, uh, and paying that penny toll to walk across the bridge, you recall? And uh, I remember the streetcars going up and down Madison. I remember the parades at Christmas time. I remember sitting on my heat register in Fort Mitchell and trying to warm up so I could go on to school in the morning and listening to the radio. And the radio program we listened to was sponsored by Coppins and Covington. And they told you, have a bright, cheery good morning from Coppins and Covington. I know some of you remember all of that. Absolutely. Raise your hand. Yeah, you, I know you remember He's that too. Guy. Common grand. So you remember all of that, of course. And uh, my father uh, liked bourbon, and he had another friend who liked bourbon a great deal, and they used to meet together up at old R. Carroll's, the restaurant there on the Dixie Highway, and of course that's Eddie R. Carroll's father. And uh, the fellow that he would drink with on Saturday, so I'd get to see him do that, was a fellow by the name of Haven Gillespie, who was from Covington. Haven was a uh, union printer, who also was a wonderful wordsmith as far as tunes were concerned. He would publish over 800 tunes, and that's probably Covington's most famous uh, musical personality, without any doubt. But Covington's had just a score of very famous, interesting people. Uh, Derwood Kirby was from Covington, and Una Merkel, who was a star of the silent screen and also later of talkies, uh, she was from Covington. And have you ever thought about this? Where is Northern Kentucky's major radio station. It's in Cincinnati. Because it was started by L.B. Wilson in Covington, but the license was moved over to Cincinnati. Does anybody know the name? CKY. Yeah, sure. CKY for yeah. the yeah. Right. And where's our television station, folks? I believe it's called WXIX. That's also a Northern Kentucky thing. That's always been a pet peeve of mine. If we had our own big radio station, our own big television station, I think Dr. Clark would have had a different view of Northern Kentucky. <laughs> right, so. so we all have our memories of Covington, and Covington's had its ups and downs. At one time, however, you have to remember, it was the third largest city in Kentucky. And it, Kenton County, and Covington in particular, has always been a stronghold of the Democratic Party. When I was growing up, they didn't have any Republicans in Covington. There weren't no, the Republicans were in Fort Mitchell. And I found that out because before I became a Whig, <laughs> I leaned toward the Democratic Party. And we had this poll when I, and uh, this was 1948. And they were having this presidential election, a fellow by the name of Dewey, some of you may remember, from New York, who was going to win, no doubt about it. And a fellow by the name of Harry S. Truman. 
who had been the vice president, who had become president, were running against one another. And we had this poll in my class. And we had 26 students at Beachwood that particular year in my class. And the vote was, are you ready for this? 25 for Dewey, one for Truman. <laughs> and I was right. <laughs> so that gave me some understanding of what it is. And things change. Uh, I taught at Murray uh, for three and a half years. And I went down there to register. And they said, uh, are you going to register Democrat? And I said, no, I'm not so sure I am. They said, surely you're not going to register Republican. <laughs> well, now it's mainly Republican down there. So things change. And things change in cities. Uh, Covington's gone through all sorts of changes. Uh, the downtown district, business district has changed and moved to Florence. Uh, and truthfully, there's a lot to be done down there. On the other hand, they've begun to develop the riverfront, and uh, the cover of our book indicates that. This is a good book. It's an interesting book. It's a book that uh, shares the talents of a multitude of people. When once I got Paul in check and stopped him from writing as much. We got some others to contribute some. I'm kidding him. He basically did his dissertation on this and we co-opted about four chapters from his dissertation. But uh, we have uh, people who have written all sorts of, of course, uh, Roger and uh, Dave. Uh, and Dave, I'm going to set you up. Uh, Dave's going to probably talk some about religion. Dave, Dave and Paul know a lot more about local history than I do, but I know a lot more about European history than they do. So, so, so there we are. And remember this, you know, how did these people, before I close here and set uh, Dave up, how did all of this take place, this settlement of this area? Well, it came from the greatest law ever passed. It's called the Law of Promagent. And what basically happened was the high-ranking officers of the Colonial Army got land grants out in the West. We were the West, you know, we were the West. And they didn't want to leave Virginia. Why should they leave Virginia? Nor did their number one heir want to leave Virginia. Because the law of promagenture says, it is the greatest law ever written, that the eldest son gets it all. And so the son number two and son number three and son number four, they came to Kentucky or Tennessee or wherever it might happen to be. Now you might conclude from that that I am the eldest son. <laughs> Yes, I am. <laughs> and I am English. Claypool is not Irish, folks. It's English. We came over here in 1662. Three brothers on the same ship. We were run out of England. We, we were Cromwellians. And, and in 1660, they restored Charles Stuart to the throne. He called in my family and said, now we'll give you a choice. We'll give you a choice of hanging or a one-way ticket to Virginia. Well, they didn't make any stupid people in my family who went to Virginia. So, well, since Paul's going to uh, say what he has to say, and Dave's about to say what he has to say, I'm going to give you something to think about. This is a religious question. You know, the uh, Paul once said that women should honor and obey men to the four corners of the earth. That, I'm paraphrasing, but that's what it says. Right? If that be true, why did God make the earth round? <laughs> As Jim said, um, I, I had several chapters to write. Um, one was on religion, one was on ethnicity or the people of Covington, and the other one was on education. So uh, I had three fairly weighty topics to uh, cover. But um, one of the things that we've talked about tonight is the, the theme, I think, of how Northern Kentucky is different than the rest of Kentucky. I remember, uh, as, as uh, Betty was saying, I was a local history librarian. I worked in the local history department at the Kent County Library for 20 years before I became director. And so, you know, I, I did a lot of Northern Kentucky history. And the new history of Kentucky came out, and I was so excited, and I, you know, the first thing I do is go to the index and look at Covington. There were, I think, two or three entries. And I there thought, you go. Oh. And I looked at Newport, and there was one or two. And, it, and I'm thinking, how in the world do you write a history of, of Kentucky and ignore, and when, when, um, when Jim was saying, you know, we're the third biggest county in the state, 
For a long time, Covington was the second biggest city in the state, up until really the 19, late, late 1940s, early 1950s. We were bigger than Lexington for a good 100 years. So we were only second to Louisville. And if you add Northern Kentucky together as a region, so if you put Boone, Kenton, and Campbell together, we're still the second largest metropolitan area in the state of Kentucky. So um, that always does tick me off a little bit. Yeah. Um, and so what does, part of my question in writing my sections was what makes Northern Kentucky different? Why are we so different than the rest of Kentucky? And I would include Boone County to a certain degree as the rest of Kentucky during a lot of this time period because Boone was more like Grant, Pendleton, Gallatin than it was like Kenton up until my lifetime when you think about it. Um, Boone was more rural. Um, the thing that set aside, I think, Covington and Kenton County in general, uh, Covington in particular, um, is th its urbanness. You know, it's, it's a, an urban area. If you look at Covington, um, immigration had a great impact on the development of Covington. Um, you, can't, you, you can't look around Covington and not see the influence of the Germans, for instance. Certainly there were Germans, uh, early German settlers in Boone County, no doubt. Uh, hopeful, hopeful Lutheran is a prime example. But the sheer numbers of immigrants who came to Covington, um, the first round were really the English and the Scots-Irish. Um, then we had the uh, famine Irish, then we had the Germans, and then we had some of the other groups. But those German immigrants, and particularly the Germans, had such a profound impact on Covington and really changed how Covington was viewed by the rest of the state. Uh, one of those ways in which Covington was viewed differently was the liquor. Uh, and particularly, uh, have you ever heard of um, the, the, um, the Welsh Guest Beer? Um, we, Certainly in Covington, the Germans brought with them a culture. They brought with them their culture. Their culture relied um, significantly on beer. How many days a year did you work? How many days a week did you work in the early 1900s? Anybody know? Six at least. Usually six. Usually your employer at least gave you Sunday off. Now, there were those who were from an English background, those from a... Um, um, different um, non-German backgrounds who um, held fast to Sunday as a day of rest. Sunday is a day you don't do work. Sunday is a day you don't drink. Sunday is a day of worship. And the Germans in Covington, and I found this true to be whether you were a German Protestant or a German Catholic, this is one thing that drew them together, was Sunday was a day of worship. They were either going to the German Reformed Church, the German Lutheran Church, or the German Catholic Church. But after church was over, they were going to the beer garden. And so Covington is dotted with these beer gardens, and they're dotted with breweries. At one time, there was over a dozen breweries in Covington. We remember what? Bavarian. Bavarian. Uh, in Newport, we remember Wiedemann. Uh, some of you might remember Heidelberg in Covington which was around for a while. There were many other smaller ones as well. But the beer garden culture um, it is very interesting in that it was not simply based on alcohol. It was based on entertainment and it was based on the entire family. And so there's a beer garden culture and a saloon culture. The beer garden culture was a family event. Um, I will admit I have 100% Germany ancestry. I had the most boring genealogy probably in this room. Uh, I have found nothing but Germans. I mean, it's just pathetic. I'm going to have to do my DNA genealogy to find out if I have anything else in my bloodline. But as a good German, many of my family members back along the way owned saloons and or taverns and beer gardens. One of them owned one of the largest beer gardens in Covington, which was called the Central Garden. Now let me tell you about the beer garden. It, they served beer, they served food, they had vaudeville, they had bowling alleys, 
Um, they had all kinds of entertainment for the whole family, and it was not just the husband that went to the beer garden. He typically brought his wife, and he typically brought his children. So it was a family gathering place, and it was a much, wholesome, much more wholesome environment than we would think of today. Um, the saloon culture came much later, um, and it really started sprouting during uh, what era? When did people start becoming more secretive about their um, alcohol consumption? Prohibition. Prohibition, um, Prohibition um, had a major impact on Northern Kentucky. Um, I put myself through um, college and through graduate school in history uh, by indexing newspapers. Has anybody ever used the Ken County Library newspaper index? I index every newspaper article from 1920 through 1932. I read every Kentucky Post and I index every article for 12 years. And so while I was doing it, I thought, well, I might as well get something out of it. So I, I based my master's thesis on prohibition in Northern Kentucky. And so um, what, what was really interesting to me was um, we had some significant pull in Frankfurt for a long time. Um, you think of um, Goebel, you think of Stevenson, um, you think of um, some other political leaders in Northern Kentucky who really had some influence in Frankfurt. Um, yes, Galvin. Uh, there were uh, also um, John G. Carlisle, uh, who had a national reputation. Um, prohibition really uh, kind of set Covington and Northern Kentucky apart in Frankfurt. Um, from the, the, the day the prohibition became effective, the next day's newspaper talked about a still blowing up in Covington. <laughs> so people were not waiting to make sure that they weren't going to follow this law. And so um, bathtub gin, the speakeasies, all of these things that come down in urban legend are based in fact. And Northern Kentucky politicians, um, some of them were making money off of the illegal trade, of course, as well. Um, we will not, the police could say, we will not report you. Um, just make sure that we get what we need to, you know, so that we won't report you. A bribe. Uh, and so Northern Kentucky, unfortunately, and throughout much of the United States, particularly urban United States, prohibition um, made criminals out of many people who really were not criminals. They were living their lives as they always had and felt that this was an unjust law. And, but what it did was, it, uh, in Frankfurt, um, the, um, the typical Kentucky politicians were look, started looking at Northern Kentucky a little bit askew. You know, what's going on up there? Um, Northern Kentucky political officials were saying at that point, you know, just leave us alone. We're fine. We don't, we don't need interference from Frankfurt. We don't, you know, just leave us alone, we'll leave you alone kind of attitude. And so um, you start seeing a pulling apart of Northern Kentucky from Frankfurt. And, and it's, it's been a long time in, in shaping, and it continues to this day. And we're, we're starting to see a little bit of that pulling back together. But prohibition is a part of that pulling apart. I think a lot of times we forget about that whole era that lasted 12 years, but may had a significant impact on our community. Uh, the other thing I think that um, divides or separates Northern Kentucky from the rest of the state uh, is education. Um, Northern Kentucky, uh, the first public high school in, in Kentucky. Anybody know? Covington High School, which is now Holmes, was actually one of the first public high schools in the state of Kentucky where you could actually get a high school diploma. Um, if you look at the history of uh, Covington, you will see there, there were everything from daycare and kindergarten through university level. What was the first degree granting institution? Jim and, um, Jim and um, Paul will not like this answer. Paul might. Paul will, he's an alumnus. What was the first degree granting institution in Northern Kentucky? For Northern college Kentucky level. Community Northern Kentucky Community College. Mm -mm. Yeah. Before, 50 years before that. The forerunner of Thomas Moore. Villa Madonna College. Oh, there was no state institution of higher learning in Northern Kentucky, really officially, until 1968. <coughs> Again, there's that other part. We were the last part of, of the last part of the state to get a public yeah. university. 
But for 50 years before that, you could get a degree, you had to get it at Villa Madonna, or you had to go across the river. Um, but also, where did Northern Kentucky start? Northern Kentucky University start? Covington. For first district school right across the street, now it's Gateway Community and Technical College, right across the street from the Covington Library. That's where, that's where Kentucky State started. Uh, and so Northern Covington has been the center of education in many ways. Uh, not only from just general uh, primary and, and high school, but also the university level. Uh, all of those, those two universities, the university and the college, both started in Covington. Um, another thing that I think um, is often overlooked um, is the Catholic nature of Northern Kentucky as opposed to the rest of the state. Um, that also made us different. Um, uh, Catholics in Northern Kentucky um, had political power where in the most of the rest of the state had limited political power. And so um, the Catholic Church in Northern Kentucky, uh, centered in Covington, um, had some significant pull. Not only uh, because of the sheer numbers of Catholics living in Covington, uh, but also because of the enormous numbers of institutions. If you look at Covington, um, it doesn't look like a southern city when you look at it religiously. Um, Southern Catholic cities don't have universities, they don't have orphanages particularly, they don't have a hospital the size of St. Elizabeth Medical Center. Um, uh, Covington is part of that um, German Triangle. Have you ever heard of the German Triangle? If you draw a map, if you draw a line on the map from, from Cincinnati to Milwaukee to St. Louis and back, uh, at one time, there was uh, over almost 50% of the German population in the United States lived within those boundaries. And Covington, Cincinnati is one of those tips of that point. And so there were enormous numbers of Germans coming into this region. Um, there are some stories of 200 arriving every day, if you can imagine. Uh, I will leave you with this about immigration as well, just to let you know how ethnically diverse Covington at one time was. In 1870, if you were walking down the streets of Covington, and you ran, if you were an adult, and you ran into another adult in downtown Covington, what were the odds of that other adult have been born in the United States? Any guesses? 85%. 1870. In 1870, the adult population of Covington was 50% native-born, 50% foreign-born. And most of those were German. Yeah. Now, can you imagine today our community being half native born and half foreign born? And it's very interesting when you look at the newspapers of that time period, 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, and they're talking about all oh, these Germans coming in and they don't want to learn English and <laughs> they want their own schools and, you know. The Covington Library has a has a, actually has a German language section. Can you believe it? And I, you know, and I'm looking at these newspaper articles, and you know, everything old is new again, basically. And I'm looking at the newspaper articles, and I'm thinking, if you would take out the word German, and there's some there's some that are on the Irish as well, so I don't want to leave the Irish out, or take out the word Irish and, and you put in a new ethnic group. You can see almost the same themes over and over and over again that we kind of have cycled through. And so um, that part was very fascinating to me, um, to see the otherness of Covington um, and the river cities in general. But I'll tell you the last thing. When I was a local history librarian, um, we did a lot of genealogy, of course. So when people would come in, the first thing that I would ask them, I would ask them two questions. And this would almost always narrow down my search. The first question was, were you from Covington or Ludlow? Because in Kenton County, almost everybody was from Covington or Ludlow because that was where the major portion of the population lived. They lived along the river. Very few people lived in uh, Independence um, or what is today Fort Mitchell, Park Hills. Those were farming communities. The second question was, were you Protestant or Catholic? If I had those two pieces of information, I could almost start you right on, this, on the right track. Um, that's what makes Covington and Northern Kentucky other, I think, if we're looking at uh, how we are different than the rest of Kentucky. And so what our job is as historians, I think, 
is to remind historians for the rest of the part of the state, our otherness doesn't make us less Kentuckian, or less Kentucky, it makes us more. We add to the richness of what Kentucky is. And so we need to remind them that yes, Boone County, Kenton County, Campbell County, we're as much a part of Kentucky as Fayette and Jefferson. And so hopefully this book will go a long way in doing that. Because believe it or not, Covington is, has, has always been the largest city in Northern Kentucky for many, many years. It still is, even though it's lost significant population. Uh, this is the first comprehensive history of Covington ever written. People would come in and say, I want a, a history of Covington. Well, I could give them a history of the religion of Covington, the education of Covington, the Germans of Covington, the Irish of Covington. We never had one book that told the entire history of Covington. We now have it. So there's no excuse for historians from around the state to ignore us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as we close, I want to remind you that this book is dedicated to the late Ron Einhouse. And I want to point out that his lovely widow and beautiful daughter are sitting in the audience. Hold up your hand. recognize that, oh my gosh, Covington's going to be 200 years old, so we better do something. And uh, he's not here to see, but I bet he's very proud. Thank you all for coming. Questions to uh, One quick question for Jim. Is it, is it true that George Clooney was one of your students? <laughs> I think I heard you tell a story about him one time. You didn't think he would be successful? <laughs> But, uh, George was enrolled in my class. I can't say that he was my student. <laughs> but I was also the dean of students at that particular time. And uh, uh, George was one of the great pranksters of all times. And uh, incidentally, I don't know if we want to put this on tape or not, his, his uh, sister worked for me. Her name is Ada. And uh, she scored on the ACT scores. 36 is perfect. She scored 36, 36, 36. George scored 36, 36, 35, 35. So he's not dumb. And uh, I'm, I take full credit for his career because, <laughs> because he caused so much havoc on campus. On one occasion, I had him in my office, which was pretty regular. Uh, and I said, George, George, George. Isn't there something else you can do in life other than terrorize us here on this campus? He <laughs> <laughs> took me to heart and off to follow what he went. He found something. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, we hope you all enjoyed the book. It'll be available in local libraries, but it's also available in the back of the room. Um, Roger is, uh, is back there um, holding up a copy. Anybody's interested? Um, they are signed. Uh, we'll personalize them for you if you if you would like. Um, they're, and they're, we they're want to thank you for at the bookstores. Yes. Joseph Beth and um, Barnes and Noble. And Barnes, Barnes and Noble. Barnes and, Noble. Yes. and Joseph Beth, Amazon.com, eBay, right. Barnes and Noble.com, Roebling Point Bookstore in Covington, and of course in the back with a special price tonight of two for eighty or forty-five each. 45 isn't special, it's two for 80. So like if you have friends and you say, well, let's save, you know, a little yeah. money here, you could save $10 just by pretending to be somebody's friend and paying for it together. <laughs> Jim, didn't do our, Jim and I didn't do our spiel, but Jim always talks about the English were very good at selling you property. That if there was any property to be sold in Northern Kentucky, the English would sell it to you. And my part of the shtick is, and the Germans would teach you how to save money after that. Yeah. <laughs> so buy your book, and uh, we'll sign it, and uh, hopefully it'll be a collector's item someday, wear it down the road, and then you can save your money. <laughs> Thank you.